going to hear from all our panelists, then we will have an opportunity for questions among the group and with you. Okay. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My case study is basically on the uh, interfaith mediation uh, mechanisms and peace building efforts being uh, used to tackle uh, basically religious conflicts in Nigeria. And the, the, the ambassador who spoke earlier have actually provided some background and has helped me you know, to, to build a foundation upon which I will uh, now build I mean, my brief talk on. Nigeria uh, is, is actually uh, I mean, a, 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 a classical example of a multi-ethnic society that had been living peacefully and the uh, ethno-religious conflict was uh, never an issue at the pre-independent period. And uh, up to the, post the immediate post-independent period, it was never also an issue. Uh, but it became a problem since the early 1990s, just like the ambassadors said, with the outbreak of a serious uh, religious riot in Kano, in the northern part of Nigeria, the Maitasene riot. And uh, that riot was actually spearheaded by a group of extremist uh, uh, Islamists who insisted on imposing Sharia and other tenets of uh, Islam on the whole of the country. And, you know, but they were basically concentrated in Kano, you know, which is the biggest city in the northern part of Nigeria. At that time, they actually drew their inspiration from the events in Iran, the, 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 the Islamic revolution that was taking place in Iran, and the outbreak uh, uh, and the escalation of extremist, Islamic extremist ideology in Egypt and some of the uh, other, uh, you know, uh, 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 Eastern countries, Arab countries, basically. And it was uh, a very serious uh, riot, and it took the government a lot of effort to bring down the, 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 the scale of, of the violence at that time, because it was, it was actually spreading, even going outside of Kano to other neighboring cities like Yola you know, and some other uh, cities at that time. Nevertheless, the, the, the violence was, was uh, brought down. But then, some of those extremist groups still remained within the society, and they were actually spreading the, 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 their, their extremist ideologies you know, within Nigerian society. Then one other remarkable thing is that the problem of religious uh, conflict is mostly restricted to the, to the northern part of Nigeria. And not only in the north, it was actually uh, restricted to states that are having an admixture of Christians and Muslim adherents. Second slide, please. You know, uh, uh, so it, it is much more common in Kaduna, Plato, Nasarawa, Adamawa, Taraba, where there uh, is an uh, admixture of Muslims and Christians, but in states of the core north, where there are Muslims, predominant Muslim, I mean, Islamic adherents, such as Sokoto, um, Katsina, and the rest, you, you hardly have such problem as such. So it is only in areas where one of the groups plans to impose its enemy on the other, and the others try to resist that you have the preponderance I mean, preponderance of uh, such violence. So in a way, the southern part of the country does not experience much of religious conflict, uh, except on occasions where there are reactions, you know, to what is happening in the in, in the north, especially where victims were brought back home, and then there are reactions from their kinsmen 
against the Aousa Fulani in the in the south. But basically, it's is 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 restricted to the north. And now it is even the northeast that is experiencing much of it. And then the advent of the Fourth Republic, actually not Third Republic, the Fourth Republic. Um, when the issue of Sharia came up, that the, the, the whole problem was uh, revived, you know, uh, some of the states insisted that they were going to be practicing Sharia laws. And in those states where there are uh, adherents of, our, of other religions, they resisted. And that is why in Kaduna, for example, since, since uh, 1999, we have witnessed uh, about four very serious violent conflicts, religious conflicts, even though they are you know, part of other uh, conflicts in other uh, uh, parts, uh, uh, I mean, in other states, such as Plato, Adamawa, and the rest. But Kaduna, Nasarawa, Plato appears to be much more, you know, uh, vociferous, I mean, in terms of the, their experiences. And then the Boko Haram group came, you know, and since you know, 2010, it has, uh, it has been a very serious uh, violence in the northeast of Nigeria. So that is a sort of uh, background to the problem of religious problem in Nigeria. But my focus basically is on the uh, efforts and policies that the government and the civil society are doing to, 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 to curtail the problem and, you know, uh, 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 and the peace building activities that are taking place. Um, first of all, the government had actually, even before now, enunciated policies that uh, appears to, I mean, that attempts to ensure equity among the various, you know, religious adherents in Nigeria. Even though some of those policies have attracted criticism, because some people believe that Nigeria should be a secular state and the government should not have any business with, with religions. But then the government thought, I mean, since politics is already enmeshed in, in religion, it is very, very difficult for the government to actually put off its hand. So the government sponsors people to Mecca and all the pilgrimage. At the same time, they sponsor people to Jerusalem, you know, uh, spending a lot of national resources. Now, at a point in time, scholars have actually raised the issue. What about the traditional religious adherence? I mean, it's an injustice if you are concentrating on only the two dominant religions and ignoring the third you know, aspect. I mean, that's just by the way. Then the government has also encouraged the establishment of inter-religious uh, mediation agencies, such as Nigeria Inter-Religious Council, at the national level. At the state level, there are equivalent of such organizations and what they do basically is to bring together the, the leaders of, of, of the dominant religions you know, for dialogues and for mediation activities you know, in order to prevent and to prevent you know, uh, uh, conflict and violence, as the case may be. And then, over the past 20 years or so, we have witnessed the emergence of, you know, you know, of so many uh, interfaith mediation organizations uh, civil society organizations such as the Interfaith Mediation Center, Interfaith Action, blah, blah, blah. Now, the Interfaith Mediation Center is a classic example of what the adherents of the two religions could actually do together. Uh, I mean, it's a case study of an Islamic leader working together with, with, with a Christian leader, a, I mean, a Christian reverend. And they've been working for the past 20 years now, bringing together their followers and uh, I mean, intervening in, 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 in areas that have ex experienced violence by you know, initiating peace building activities, negotiation, and encouraging people to, 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 to view the issue. I mean, basically, the two religions that are in conflict, first of all, are foreign religions you know, in Nigeria. And then, basically, their tenets are quite similar. But because the whole issue has been emerged into politics, the tendency is that politicians and some other religious leaders who benefit from such violence often confuse their followers. And of course, the problem of poverty, you know, uh, lack of, so, I mean, adequate education and so on and so forth is pervasive in the society, which, which enables them to, to be able to recruit ignorant adherents as followers. You know, so those adherents are actually the foot soldiers. You see the leaders in the comfort of their jets, in the comfort of their homes, and so on and so forth, dining together, 
you know. But when it comes to political you know, disagreement, they mobilize these people and then perpetrate violence. So what the civil society do, uh, does is to attract the attention of those ignorant followers to those issues and to encourage them you know, to, 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 to work together and you know, uh, so that peace can reign among them. And then they also attempt to, do, to carry out some rehabilitation activities and resettlement of victims of religious violence. Okay. You know, so they do this by mobilizing funds from local and international organizations who could assist them to, to provide succor to all these victims. And of course, they provide counseling services to traumatize individuals and groups, you know, who have uh, uh, experienced, you know, uh, such uh, violence. Then they also support the reintegration of the victims back into the society you know, by, by providing camps at the initial stage where some training activities and some mediation activities, you know, takes place. And then they also uh, provide some economic opportunities for them to reintegrate them back effectively into the society. Some of them, after they have uh, given them the skill, they give them micro funds to, to, to enable them to start their businesses. So such are some of the activities that, this is the next slide, please. Yes, that this uh, organization does. But they also have their problems. Uh, insecure, insincerity and lack of commitment of some of the religious leaders are there. Like I told you earlier, there is an, a mesh of religion and politics now. So some of those leaders who are even engaged in interfaith mediation uh, activities are also doing it for political purposes. You know, so that's a problem because of the insincerity involved. Then, of course, insufficient education to carry out mediation you know, among the, the, the adherents, the rigid attitudes of mediation, the tendency towards extremism and fundamentalism, even during negotiations. Some of the extremists believe that they shouldn't even negotiate at all with the other parties and that it is strong, I mean, their God will be angry at them, blah, blah, blah. So it takes a lot of effort to educate them to actually you know, be engaged in it. And then, of course, lack of confidence. Uh, next slide, please. And then the activities of religious entrepreneurs, religious conflict entrepreneurs. Some people supply weapons during such violence. Some people collect contracts for repairs you know, and for, for other damages that have been uh, carried on. And then, of course, large scale poverty and illiteracy, like I mentioned earlier, and then inadequate resources to, to carry out some of their set activities. Next slide, please. What the future of interfaith peace building activities is, uh, well, uh, the Boko Haram issue is coming down now. I mean, with the, with the turning around of uh, declaring a caliphate, the military are now able to, to curtail them, but we don't know the extent to which they are going to uh, curtail them. But again, such extremism is spreading to other parts of the country. So the tendency is that you know, a lot of interfaith peace building activities will continue to be built. And then the future of Nigeria as a country itself, as a big oil producer, is also being threatened by the religious fundamentalism problem. And so all of these issues are likely to, to extend the, 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 the interfaith activities into the future. Thank you very much. <laughs>